It is common for great men to write accounts of their life. I certainly do not make any claims to greatness. Like my great aunt used to say, it would be like blowing a tin whistle when a jazz orchestra is playing. But heck, I could never sit still. It seems I have been fated to roam the world and experience the worst kinds of hardships while traversing oceans, deserts, mountains, and glaciers. From an early age, I have had the urge to travel. I could be in China one day, in England tomorrow, and perhaps tramping in the sun-baked deserts the next uh, the, the, the day after. That's the opening paragraph of the First World War Adventures of Nariman Karkaria, whose translator Murli Ranganathan is our guest on the latest edition of Scroll Books. Welcome, uh, Murli. Hi, hi, Murli. Naresh. Good to be here. Though many Western accounts of the First World War give them short shrift, more than one million Indians served overseas during the conflict, and more than 60,000 of them died in the battle, on battlefields around the world. For some reason, uh, the only book-length account of the Great War written by an Indian that we know about is this one by a Parsi from Navsari, published in 1922. And until Murli Ranganathan translated it, it was accessible only to Gujarati speakers. Uh, a self-taught scholar, Murli can speak more than half a dozen languages and is previously translated from the Marathi, the wonderfully engaging book whose title in English is Govan Narayan's Mumbai, an urban biography from uh, 1863. He is also the editor of the collected work of J.B. Nag, who wrote extensively about 19th century Maharashtra. Welcome, Murli, and thanks for being on our show. Uh, to begin with, how did you come across this book and how did you decide to embark on this translation project? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time inside libraries where nobody else goes typically and sort of, you know, literally trawl through collections which have not been seen for maybe decades, maybe more than that. And uh, I spent literally the last 10 to 15 years doing that, doing just that. And uh, you know, when I was looking for books on theater, I mean, I was looking for books on theater in Marathi, in Urdu, in Gujarati, and suddenly I find this book starting with the title Rang Bhumi. And Rang Bhumi, as we all know, translates very simply as theater. And I thought maybe, ah, here's a theater book. Let me just go and have a look. And I sat out, started reading it. And as I started reading it, I mean, the first chapter is about how he decamps to China. So you wouldn't really know that after that, it's actually a war memoir. And so I kept going, kept going, theater, theater, no theater. But it was actually Ranabhumi, not Rangbhumi. I mean, so uh, so I just read it and I realized that this is this 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 does look something which which sort of you know has not been uh, really talked about before. So I sort of started looking around, trying to see if anybody knew of of Nariman Karkaria. And then I realized that forget Gujarati. I mean, practically every other language in my in in India just didn't have any war memoir to speak of until the last few, a couple of decades when we started, you know, when the publishing industry started being more active and engaging with, 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 with the military who are still alive. So uh, the war memoir was a strange object in most Indian literary uh, cultures. And, and I kept looking at it. I didn't want to translate it because translation, you know, is a very lonely, arduous and financially negative process. So uh, I just didn't want to do it. I mean, and then uh, Amitav Ghosh and I were in conversation and I and he asked me if I can publish the discovery of this book. I was I was quite happy to do that because I hoped that somebody else would do it. I mean, th this was in 2012 and, and then I waited for 10 years, the eight years actually, and then the pandemic hit. Nobody else was doing it. So I myself thought, why not do it during the pandemic? So I just sat down and and got it done i mean that's how it actually happened so tell us who was karkari and what does the book describe uh, i mean all practically all that we know of karkari is what karkari himself says i have tried to search for him high and low look for look for family members and look for descendants sons daughters whatever but i was totally unsuccessful i mean there was a book which basically was a history of the karkari clan but published in 1916 when uh, when Karkaria himself was just a just a just a boy. I mean, maybe 20 years old. So that doesn't tell you much about Karkaria except that he had he had already traveled a lot and he had already written about his travels. 
so so even by 1916 he was already sort of you know famous in the in the if not in the community at least in within his own clan the karkaria clan as a as a travel writer i haven't been able to discover anything before 1916 by him of course so all that we have is, is, is his own book here and in, in which he talks about himself as a truant schoolboy who never reads anything and who sort of certainly is not one of those you know the the types who would actually be i mean he sort of paints himself as a i mean in a very very self deprecating manner all through the book actually but obviously that's not this is happening true. in navsari in a in a parsi enclave in navsari absolutely this is all happening in navsari navsari right now is 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 a is, is almost a suburb of surat in those days it still had you know pretensions to being a small town and uh, the parsi community was one of the dominant communities of that town and practically before they came to bombay navsari was the was the capital of the parsi community so the, so you would have lanes like karkaria lane in in the in the vicinity of the the, the main fire temple which which uh, which which has one of their most important fires burning in navsari right and uh, the, you were telling us about uh, karkaria and uh, what, what the what he says in his book yeah yeah so i think the book is itself to be i mean if i mean i would rather that your your readers and your listeners read the book to find out about him but i can tell you that i mean he wrote another book i mean uh, and that you find little bit more about him in terms of you know his travel log to iran which is about uh, 50% larger than this book i mean so it's a fairly long long i mean it was a year year long travel and he documents it with a view to write unlike the unlike this book which was i think written perhaps after he came back and was wondering why and was narrating his stories and that that got transferred into 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 print but i think the 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 later book was was uh, was was written to our so to speak and clearly he comes across as a very well read person and as a person who clearly was comfortable with gujarati with english and perhaps even a smattering of persian also so i mean so i mean you one one shouldn't get taken in by his by his sort of claims to uh, to being a total dockhead that's for sure so give us a sense of his travels uh, first he leaves navsari and then where does he head yeah so i mean if you are if you are in navsari the only place to go to first is bombay so he sort of you know crept out of his house one one dark night as he says and uh, and and takes the, the the late night train to bombay comes to bombay and picks up a jamia jamshed newspaper sees that there is a there is a steamer leaving for for china the following day goes to a pawn broker uh, sort of you know uh, pawns his gold buttons from his from his uh, from his uh, coat and uh, and his watch and gets the money ship uh, ship ticket fare and then sort of travels in in some amount of style i mean you can see that he describes it, the italian liner rubatino varis having spaghetti and wine and brandy and so on and so forth and his problems really start once he uh, once he sort of uh, disembarks in hong kong and finds that he has nowhere to go i mean it's he's he's at a, he's literally at a dead end and somehow through various contrivances he manages to sort of you know make contact with the parsi community in hong kong and they sort of i mean with some reluctance they they do help him and they give him a i would say a menial job actually uh, and he's saying that yeah i mean anything something is better than nothing and he spends about a year in hong kong then he get then he has gets into a fight with his employer goes off to peking spend some time in peking and he describes and that's when the travels really sort of get rolling and after two or two two and a half years he comes back to to bombay and to nausari and to so and to his family and but by which time he is now a See, is a well-traveled man, and his family. I think his family now realizes that there's no way they can hold him back in Nausari. He goes back to China in 1914, and within within a few months' time, it's it's the war is pretty much set in, and at, and here there's a little bit of a gap. He suddenly decides that he has to be a part of the war. why is that and all that is not clearly explained i mean because uh, nausaria does does sort of you know leap over many many uh, parts and here's one crucial part he sort of misses out about what motivates him to join the the join the war effort and then what motivated him to go back go to london rather than come back to bombay to join the indian army so you, so you see him traveling to london overland and that's because you you couldn't i mean the the the, the seas were already being bombed by german warships and uh, the only way to get to london was to go by land and luckily for him the trans siberian railway had been built literally a few years before that 
and so somewhere in the late in late 1914 november 1914 he sort of sets off on a pretty much a adventure trip from peking to london by train i mean which would be an adventure even now uh, about 200 years 100 years later but uh, in that time it was i think a pretty much uh, sort of a, i think a pioneering effort of sorts where he sort of travels for about i would say 6 to 7 weeks and he visits uh, siberia i think has to has to stay there for a day or so then he goes off to st petersburg where he has got a friend with whom he stays for a week and then via finland norway sweden and finally he sort of takes the takes the boat from bergen to newcastle and then the train to london so it's a pretty much a long involved journey which which would challenge even a uh, 20 year old person even right now so that's how we find the got to london and along the way he's beset with worries about or, or concerns about how much everything costs which is sort of Absolutely. very familiar to the modern indian traveler also exactly i mean i mean going to scandinavia is 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 going to be a shock now and it was a shock then i mean 5 rupees for a meal i mean which would translate to say 5000 now i don't know what the conversion rate would be for for rupees from 1920 rupees and 2020 rupees but yeah i mean it it, 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 it the prices were mind boggling and he seems to have had had the money i mean the most important part is he had the money he had the funding to actually make the journey which is which which is where you know some of us uh some of the i mean he doesn't provide you enough details about where that money came from who was he in touch with in london and how did he actually and where, and the most crucial part how did he actually get into the british army and the uh, middlesex regiment i mean that's that's uh, that's the part which he skipped completely and uh, for, for 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 quite a quite a long while i was skeptical about the entire story because of you know the, this gap and i sort of started digging around military archives to see if there's anything which supports what he what he's saying but you know a lot of the first world war archives have been destroyed not much has survived but he gives a he, he gives his uh, what do you say his uh, his registration number 2312 or i think that's what the number is and you use that number go to the go to the war office archives and search you will you will get a record for nariman karkaria there so that after i got that and i had to thank my sister meera for for actually having done this bit of research for me and i managed to sort of convince myself yes he is a real man and he is a real man who actually joined the british army and who actually seems to have experienced all i mean all that he has said that he he did and incredibly as you point out uh, he saw action not on one not on two but on three different fronts absolutely i mean that is mind boggling i mean uh, i mean I, the, given the mortality rates on these fronts i mean especially the you know the the western front uh, i mean where, which is why the battle of the somme was was fought for over, over over many months actually and uh, in which karikarya himself also got finally injured on the very last day that he was he was supposed to be withdrawn from from that front and uh, he i mean he, it was just pure luck that he survives that 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 the trench warfare and uh, manages to get back to london alive recuperates and then he's posted to uh, to to the, to the middle eastern front and you see him going to egypt and from egypt to uh, to greece and then working his way up to the balkans so uh, so so uh, man, i mean uh, and what i mean before that he actually goes to jerusalem and fights in the middle eastern front and he was there when jerusalem was taken so i mean it's it's quite mind boggling but i'm boggling that he manages to to do uh, do all these three fronts and comes out alive and willing to tell the story so that's that that is that i think that is the, the i mean the what do you say i mean uh, the most striking part of this memoir is is the fact that he actually saw action on three fronts and actually in the balkan front he was as he says he is an interpreter i mean because the indian army was fighting there and i think finally they they lost uh, i mean they, they were they were unable to get any any indian who could actually speak english and and some indian language and they 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 transferred karkaria from his regiment in uh, in the in the middle east in jerusalem and transferred him just transfer only him to the balkan front so that he could go and help as an interpreter to the soldiers who got injured at the front so at least in ba- the balkan front he wasn't fighting but he i think the horrors which you see in a hospital in a war hospital are enough to sort of i think churn anybody's stomach and he describes those in fairly great detail what were the challenges you faced um, translating this particular manuscript ah uh, i think the the, the 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 you know the biggest challenge was to convince myself that i would be able to do it without a dictionary 
because this this is written in you know in 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 a, in a i mean not straightforward gujarati but something which which the parsi spoke and wrote it so that i mean so it that so it was it was not just a dialect it was the language of literature for the for the parsis and it was i mean a a, a, a person uh, schooled in in standard gujarati would find it difficult to read this work though it's only about say 100 years old and so uh, so he would find it difficult to read this work as well as many of the words he uses are uh, are 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 words which are just not there in 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 standard or non standard gujarati dictionaries so uh, one had to have the experience of having read parsi gujarati works from let's say the from the from the 1820s onwards uh, all the way up to the 1920s to be able to undertake something like this and for for various reasons i happen to have it and so i have been i have spent the better part of the previous decade just you know literally uh, pouring through these texts and if you have read parsi text from the 1840s karkaria's text is pretty much easy peasy so uh, i didn't have really any problems doing it and i really actually didn't see consult a dictionary ever for this for for this uh, for this one i mean my first marathi book i mean uh, i mean i had to keep running to the dictionary quite often because there were many archaic words on a, in, a, in a in a text from the 1860s but in this case even if i was struggling i mean i might have had to go i find out what could have been the persian word which he has twisted around and uh, made it into this one so uh, so uh, that was something which i attempted a few times but gujarati yes there was there are really no gujarati dictionary so i was, it, was, it was just a matter of chance that i, I happened to be pretty familiar with parsi gujarati and i could sort of do it pretty you know easily in that sense compared to my other translations which which do take a, take the <laughs> take quite a lot of effort <laughs> you you mentioned just now sort of the other texts you've been reading you've done us a wonderful uh, you wrote for scroll a wonderful piece on early parsi uh, novels in english uh, uh, what was the literary milieu of the parsis uh, around that period what were the kinds of texts they were producing as you said as you've told me before in conversations there were travelogues of various sorts also yeah See, I think you should see. I mean, you should. One has to understand there were two registers. I mean, not for just for the Parsis, but for practically every community which aspired to sort of modernity and progress and those kind of words. There were two registers. There was there was there was some. There was a minority within that within that community which, by the 1880s, was reading and writing in English. And these were the people who started writing the novels by say 1890s, 19 early 1900s. but for the like you know if you go to the parsis there was a, there was a, the majority of them were reading writing and conversing in gujarati that was the literary language of the parsis all the way up to the 1950s or even 60s so so it was pretty much gujarati gujarati all the way bombay was pretty much the center of gujarati printing the number of newspapers journals printed in gujarati with a specific parsi audience really boggles the mind i mean i mean for a community which never exceeded more than 100000 population in in and around bombay to have had so many journals being published so many books being published and so on i mean is 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 something which which uh, which certainly is, is is very impressive and so you, you you'd find that every parsi household would have subscribed to either the jame jamshed or the kasare hind or the akbar saudagar or one of those newspapers or maybe all of them and plus of course the mumbai samachar which which was the mother of them all and uh, which of course was not read just by the parsis but also by gujaratis from every other community also but that also had a fairly substantial parsi uh, uh, clientele so so, that, so that you would be reading gujarati newspapers you would be reading gujarati weekly magazines and there would be monthly specialized journals and there would be cartoon uh, magazines hindi panch pakwadhani maja all kinds of stuff everything in gujarati so if you see if you see uh, nariman karkaria's reading list both in rang bhumi par rakhad and his later book iran bhumi par rakhad it's pretty much gujarati i mean he's reading all the persian texts in gujarati translation so if, if you see barjor nama or shah nama they're all you know barjor nama is clearly a gujarati title of a persian classic and uh, so he's he's reading typically uh, gujarati translations of persian and perhaps even gujarati translations of english books also so so gujarati was the main main uh, was a mainstay and even the travelogues i mean the parsi started writing travelogues from very slowly and it, by the 60s all the communities were writing but the parsis took to it 
aggressively by the 1880s and you have you had famous authors writing travelogues of the travels all across india mumbai to kashmir and then there were people going to dakshin hindustan and those kind of places and then they were going all over the world so there are a lot of parsis were were traveling the world and writing about it i mean so a few of them wrote in english but many of them wrote about the travels in gujarati and uh, and for karkaria these travelogues were clearly the role model as i mean there were no war memoirs to read in any indian language and uh, even the english uh, texts i mean the war memoir as a as a as a genre really came into its own only in the first world war obviously you had personal experiences of war accounts and so on but uh, the memoir as an autobiography as a personal narrative really came into its own only in the in, uh, after the first world war and uh, i mean as a as a as a as a mainstream narrative i'm sure there are exceptions to that and uh, but so but karkaria doesn't seem to have had access to any of them so it was travel logs which he was looking at when he was trying to uh, you know trying to sort of frame his book and the, you know the the, the title rakhad rakhad is basically rakhad patti rambling sauntering i um, mean being a flona i mean those kind of that those are the connotations which sort of come to mind when you hear the word rakhad which which is which is actually uh, sort of a contraction of the word rakhad patti which also is used in bombay hindi also so uh, so he so he's sort of you know it's it, it's all about going from place to place sometimes without really any true objective in mind but in this case he obviously had some some plans and uh, so he sort of frames it as as a travel log and you could read it as a travel log too but the the but the war experiences dominate the book in that sense and that's therefore it becomes a war memoir 100 years later uh which are the places uh, the other travel uh, uh books that parsis wrote at that time um, you said some parsis have sort of actually wrote about uh, going to america for instance right um, so let, if, you, if you start i mean if you look at the famous parsis i mean dada by nawroji i mean who who could be more famous than that i mean so he is he he, uh, he here's here's a man who's going to london quitting his job as a professor all that he stood for for the first 30 years of his life and he's trying to make a new life as a businessman in london so he's 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 off on the ship from bombay to 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 sort of marseille and then overland to to london and clearly he is already in arrangement with the ras goftar one of the leading uh, a newspaper which he founded himself in 1851 to say that yes i will write you a letter at every port so he reaches aden after a week or two and there's a letter coming back from aden to bombay which gets published as the first part of the travel log and then he goes a little for the little ahead and he sends off a letter perhaps from marseille and then there's another letter from 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 paris and then there's a letter from london so you have this travel I mean, literally live travel log reporting in a way reportage of sorts and uh, i think it was written with the hope that he would publish a travel log at some point of time after he came back but i think life overtook uh, his, his 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 literary plans at that point of time and he never did that but that was one of the major travel logs which was pub- which was published serially in the ras goftar uh, in the, in 1885 1855 sorry and even before that you have another famous parsi not so famous as as uh, the as dada bai called nawroji fardunji there's a road named after him just behind the regal theater in bombay and uh, nawroji fardunji went to afghanistan in 1837 as a as you know as an intern as an intern to the after uh, to, to the afghan uh, afghan uh, envoy from from the east india company and uh, He, he he and he is also writing a lot about his experiences or as a, as he travels from bombay to to baruch and from baruch he takes the steamer to go to goa and goa all the way through saurashtra and from saurashtra he goes into kutch and takes another steamer to karachi then goes up the indus to bahawalpur and from there on to afghanistan and all of that is also a travel log i think he wrote it in english but for some reason the english text was not published and so somebody published a translation of that text in 1853 in a in a gujarati magazine jagat premi i think and uh, so that so this, these were all travel logs written in the 1850s which were published in magazines and newspapers there were a few more but then the books started coming in the 1860s you had dosabai framji karaka going to london in 1859 or something and coming back in 1861 and publishing a monster book with lots of beautiful illustrations of of london city and uh, on all its uh, all its uh, monuments and its people and so on and so forth and that literally opened the flat gates 
in 1862 an american went to to uh, to uh, to the us when when the during the civil war and uh, he 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 comes back and writes a uh, little very short i mean this the very small travel log about his experiences in 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 the united states what's happening there and how that affects people in bombay and it affected them quite a lot because that's when the cotton uh, boom happened in bombay and uh, bombay was richer than ever was before and until it sort of all bust in 1865 so uh, so that was another travel log and then people were traveling within india too i mean hindustan ma musafiri was a was a was a grand production i mean the a group of parsis 1863 they left bombay and they sort of went all around the colonial colonial india comparing bombay its facilities with other cities like madras with calcutta with lucknow with delhi and sort of contrasting what what what's happening in these colonial cities why are they better or worse off than bombay bombay was and and seeing what could be done to sort of make bombay even more world class than it was i mean that was the sort of theme of hindustan ma musafiri written by ardeshir framji moose published in 1874 and there were even smaller travel logs about you know uh, the cricket clubs going all across india and to the and to the uk to, to london and they have also had the travel logs theater groups had the travel logs so all kinds of travel logs were being written and clearly all this was being consumed by 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 the parsi public in in pretty much large numbers and and uh, narman karkari obviously had access to many of them sitting in nausari perhaps his father's library perhaps a public library in nausari which which had these books and there is a library in nausari which dates back to to uh, to to that time the first dastur mehrji rana library where i found a copy of karkariya's book and they have almost all of these books in their collection clearly karkariya might have access them too who knows what were the sections of karkariya's travel that gave you the most delight i mean if you if you, if you see the trench warfare bits were pretty much you know Uh, I mean, especially the last uh, where the when the last stand, so to speak, in which he sort of I mean comes face to face with Germans is is something which you have read in many other books. But what I really liked about his uh, experiences, he clearly says that I mean trench warfare is something. But I mean it's not as if the people elsewhere were having an easy time. I mean fighting in the in the hills of Israel and or, or what is now Israel is certainly was certainly not easy. I mean going across Hebron and Jerusalem and and uh, and literally having what do you say? hand fights with the turkish soldiers was something equally traumatic and extremely dangerous and that section i think i felt was was you know and the and the retreat the mistakes the mistakes which the british army made with his his his, his group made and how they retreated and the kind of uh, you know the casualties they had to suffer because of various mistakes that sort of captures something which i which at least i don't recall reading in too many other first world war memoirs and so that sort of you know gives you uh, something which is uh, which is not really been covered before and which also contrasts the fact that it's not just the western front there are many other fronts and there were really pitched battles being fought elsewhere too so that sort of sort of stands out for me as a, as a, as a pretty good section and then there are sections where he's where he's a tourist i mean i mean he, he's off to he's gone off to georgia and azerbaijan i mean with the with the british army you know uh, azerbaijan was, still, was i mean the, the turmoil he describes in azerbaijan between the azerbaijanis and the armenians was something which was very much going on when i was translating just those sections in uh, in 2020 i mean when they were still, when they were when that again sort of flared up and uh, he, he he talks about it in passing where the british army tried to occupy azerbaijan for a few months and he was part of that uh, that that and that sort of uh, that division which was in azerbaijan and he goes to baku and visits tbilisi and so on so on so you can you can see him sort of you know engaging with uh, with the locals observing a little if you have their lifestyle and uh, and but always remaining a parsi at the same time while he's even in, uh, in 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 baku also so so that that sort of you know sort of uh, typifies his his sort of you know self regard as well as the the approach which he takes to 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 writing his uh, his book what are you working on now oh there's a lot of balls i'm i'm juggling a few projects here and there and uh, and i'm wondering what to translate next i think that's that's something which uh, which sort of you know plays in the back of my mind and which language to translate from is also another thing which i'm looking at so uh, so that's there are there are some very good autobiographies 
from the 19th century, both in uh, Marathi and in Gujarati, which just haven't been looked at by anybody. I mean, this Karkaria book, I mean, uh, you, I mean, you, you introduced it as something restricted to the Gujarati audience. I don't think the Gujarati audience, anybody ever saw it after the, after the 20s. It was, it was pretty much a lost book. And there are so many other lost books which which do need to be resurrected, and uh, and I'm you know I'm wondering if I mean if we can have a Murthy classical library in in Harvard, can can we not have a not so classical library for our for our more modern texts in 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 some part of India? I mean that's that's something which always uh, puzzles me. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Murli, and uh, congratulations on your book. Thank you so much, Naresh, for having me. It was fun talking to you. Bye.